so welcome everyone. Uh, before I start, I'll quickly throw an introduction. Uh, I am Sioli, as you may have been able to read. Um, if you haven't seen me before, I am uh, an audio guy primarily, but I also do level design here and there. Um, I do the soundtrack for Beyond Sky and Elsewhere with one other composer, and I do a lot of sound design on the side for other projects, uh, mostly for BS. Uh, and then I said I also do level design for Oblivion and a bunch of BS, BS provinces. So today we're focusing on audio um, because I've, I think I did a level design lecture last time. And I've done, I believe, two music things before in here uh, for streams. And I always, I, I never really went into true detail. So today we're going into the foundation of how what audio actually is and how it actually functions, essentially. So we're covering a few things today. Um, you can read them here, sound theory, spectrum, synthesis, and potentially we'll be diving into psychoacoustics and some basic music theory, depending on how much time we have and how much interest there is. Um, because as I said, it's quite theoretical, the first half or so of this stream. So it really depends on what you guys want, but uh, let's just get straight into this. Um, so first of all, as I said, I've done two um, audio lectures before, both were on music, and they were fun, and they were nice, but I never really um, explained why things worked the way they do. I just showed people like, hey, I, I can do this, and I've done this and this, and you can use it like this, but I never properly explained why things function that way, and you, know, you don't really need to know that to have fun, but if you want to get into this stuff, you do need to understand the core principles and the actual physics behind everything um so i figured i'm just gonna dive into that it's probably not going to be super interesting generally compared to the last ones but this is very important and to be honest sound is all around you so you could still pick something useful up here uh, i find myself using my, my knowledge in audio even when i'm walking outside you can you can pinpoint directions much better and stuff so it's, it's pretty cool Either way, this is a bit more complex than usual. Uh, I've simplified it as much as I can, but again, it's a bit more theoretical, so just keep that in mind. But uh, disclaimer aside, we're diving into the theory of sound, if I can go to the next thing. Thank you. Um, first of all, we're starting with behavior of sound in general, and I'm not talking audio here. Um, I'm talking sound, by which I mean the physical sound that you're hearing right now, the physical sound of everything, how it moves through the air. Um, you've probably seen waves before in an ocean or on a lake. Uh, when, when you're talking about the ocean, when you're on the beach, the waves, they kind of roll towards you. They go from point A, which is for your point of view of the horizon, to point B, which is you on the beach. They travel in one direction. When you're on the lake and you throw a stone in or touch the, the, the water a little bit, it ripples and the waves extend in a circle. Sound does something similar. Um, it's waves just like water, but instead of being in water, they're in the air, and they travel in a sphere instead of a circle. So when I clap in my hands, the sound doesn't go forward or backwards, it goes in every possible direction at once, uh, which is pretty complex to, to think about when you're trying to figure out how this stuff works. So for the sake of simplicity, uh, I have designed this whole thing in a 2D perspective. So we're going to pretend that sound flows only from point A to point B, left and right on a graph. But just keep in mind that it actually goes in all directions, and that's why sound studios look so weird. Because you need a lot of specialized objects and specialized positioning to control the sound. Because imagine, you know, one sound travels in all directions and reflects off of walls, and there's a lot of stuff going on. So to keep it simple, we're doing it on a graph. So then we're moving into the first core principle, I suppose, which is amplitude. So here you can see um, a normal sound wave. Um, we'll get into what this exactly is a bit later on. Essentially, sound waves or something is, is classified as a sound wave when it completes a full cycle, which means you have a, a dead zone line. If your, you know, your wave doesn't get above this line, then there's no sound, it doesn't really exist. Um, and a full cycle is up, positive, maximum, to a negative phase below the dead zone, um, negative ma maximum, and then back to the start. The reason this is important is because every other fundamental rule, principle, and function in audio is based on this very thing. So a full cycle, one wave is up, down, and return. 
that's really important. This is not one wave, the full picture is basically. So you can think of sound as energy in essence, right? Sound is just movement. So um, again, when I clap in my hands, you can hear the sound because I'm pushing the air, essentially. Um, that movement in the air is the energy being, or the result of the energy being converted from, you know, my hands into the air. So the reason I'm going on about energy is because essentially what you could say is that when you have more energy, so a stronger energy, um, you could get a louder sound wave. Because if I clap soft, it's not much, but if I go louder, more energy, more sound. So this is commonly referred to as amplitude. Um, once again, talking about this dead zone line, the further your maximum peaks are away from this line, the louder it is. Pretty straightforward, just higher is louder. Um, amplitude is often also just referred to as loudness or volume, or there's a lot of different you know um, terms for it, but amplitude is the official one. But energy does not just convert to um, the amplitude or the loudness, but it also uh, transfers to speed or rather density, which is the length of the wave. So diving a bit deeper, once again, we have uh, amplitude top left, top right. You can see them here. Uh, here you see it actually explained a little bit. Quiet is just a lower amplitude and the more energy is louder pushing mm -hmm. Amplitude, which is just louder. Down here, we get something different. So, as I said, energy also transfers to pitch or to frequency or length. You need to keep in mind that sound or the speed of sound is a consistent factor. It never changes. I believe it was 343 meters per second. That's always the same. So, when you have a higher pitched tone or higher pitched note in music, it's not a faster wave, it is a more dense wave. So we measure frequency or length of the wave or the pitch of your note. We measure it in the amount of full cycles per second. So once again, full cycle was this, up, down, return. Um, a full cycle, you can actually see them here. You can see three of them, so one, two, and three. We measure this in cycles per second. Um, there's reasoning for that, but that's quite complex. But essentially, you're measuring how many full waves you can fit into a single second. It's always in seconds. So in this case, you can see that the wave doesn't even complete. It reaches the positive max and doesn't even get the negative max. So what that means is that this is a lower pitch than that one. Um, you could say that the more energy you have, the more you were able to squash more full waves into that one second time frame. And essentially, more energy, more higher pitch, is it's pretty much the way you can view this. Uh, There's a bit more to it, but essentially, there's one more important thing. You can see it here, length, um, and here as well, just the length. This actually has influence on how the sound responds. For example, um, you've probably heard a concert in the distance or a party or something at some point in your life. You're not there, but you can hear it in the distance. Sometimes uh, you can actually feel the bass of the music in your, in your stomach and in your body when you're quite far away from the actual thing taking place. Um, this is actually because sound waves, just like water waves, they're a physical thing, like they move around you, they move through the air. Um, as I just said, or a bit ago, uh, sound moves at what I believe was 343 meters per second. When you think about that, when you get a wave of one full cycle per second, that wave is 300 fucking meters long. So, waves like that are able to physically bend themselves around buildings and entire structures. So that's why when you're walking somewhere and you hear a concert in the distance, you can sometimes feel the bass because there isn't an obstacle large enough to block that massive wave. Another cool thing or important thing to note is that the cycles per second is measured, the frequency as we call it, is measured in hertz. Uh, I, I guess it's because it was discovered by someone named Hertz. I don't actually know, but <laughs> um, that's an important thing to know because that's used everywhere in audio. So Hertz is the frequency, which is the length of the wave, which translates to the pitch of your sound. So one more thing, this one is not super important, but it's still a relevant one nonetheless. Phase. This is really funky stuff. Um, we can see two sound waves here, blue and red. And if you take a closer look, you'll see that they're on the same amplitude, same positive, same negative. And they also have the same frequency because you can see a difference in length here, 
or rather difference in time, and here it's pretty much the same, there's no difference. So these two waves are identical, but the difference is, in this case, that one of them has been shifted a little bit, delayed with, I don't know, maybe a second or something. Delaying identical sound is very dangerous, because what you get is something called phase cancellation, or partial cancellation. So moving in here, you can have something in or out of phase. And this is really cool stuff because here you can see the same scenario, two identical waves, same amplitude, same frequency, and they're actually aligned. You can see that the positive and the negatives are aligned with one another um, in both waves respectively, which means they actually add up. Uh, if they're aligned like this, they'll actually get twice as loud. The frequency doesn't change, but the energy in amplitude actually increases. And because it's so perfectly aligned and it's the same wave, you get a doubled... Um, loudness. You can actually have it partially like this, where they're not fully aligned, but you can still see that the positive energies and the negative ones sort of overlap. This will also boost your, your um, amplitude, but not by a double, because that's only when you align them like this. The cool thing is this, because as you can see, this is out of phase, 180, 180 degrees, which basically means that it's perfectly out of phase, the exact opposite of this. This, right here, this single graph is the fundamental technique behind all noise-canceling headphones and earphones. Because what you're effectively getting is if you take a sound, get the same sound and invert the phase, then the positives and the negatives are actually counteracting each other and they'll cancel out and this, the sound will end up on that dead zone and you get nothing. So noise-canceling headphones and stuff, they actually record your environment and play it back to you but in an inverted phase. Very simple concept and if you've ever worn good noise cancelling headsets, you know that it's super effective. Uh, so it's all based on a very simple technique. Uh, and this concept of phase cancellation, you rarely ever see it this perfectly aligned. Obviously, it's often like this, or even more chaotically aligned. But it, it appears in audio production all the time, because when you get a lot of sounds lined up, there's always going to be a couple of frequencies in those sounds that will conflict with each other. And part of your job as an audio designer is to hear those things and prevent them if necessary. So that was everything on waves, uh, and now we're going to dive deeper into a previously mentioned parameter, which is the frequency, because this is by far the most important thing. The spectrum is essentially a collection, or rather a range of frequencies that we can hear. So once again, you can play a sound wave at different frequencies, different pitches, and you'll be able to perceive those as you know, different notes, you could say. Um, the human ear can hear from 0 to 20,000 hertz. So once again, hertz is cycles per second, so the amount of sound waves per second, I suppose, uh, which is quite a big range. Uh, and the reason this is important is because it has a major purpose in actually how anything sounds. I'll get back to that in a minute because it sounds quite vague. Here's the spectrum visualized. Uh, I got two graphs because fuck it, why not? Um, you might be able to note, first of all, that this is a bit of a weird display. If you look at the numbers, uh, it actually increases, because here we have 10 on a tiny scale, and here we have 10,000. This is a logarithmic display. Um, there's reasons for that, but it's quite complicated. But essentially, every frequency spectrum in existence is displayed logarithmically to keep things a bit organized. Um, this is mainly because... Well, actually, I'm not going to explain it. <laughs> It'll take me an hour to do that alone. Um, but there's different regions, as you can see here, so if you turn your head a little bit, you can see there's something called the subsonic, which is rumored to be frequencies that you can't hear, but only feel. Trust me, if you turn this up far enough, you can hear it. <laughs> but um, this is the stuff that you really feel when you're at a concert. Everything from 0 to about 30 to 40 hertz is the really deep bass slash sub regions, uh, and that's what you know makes the music present in your stomach when you're at a concert, everything shakes. And the further up you move, the more clear frequencies get to a certain point, and then they start to get less clear to you. Uh, and each region has their own little purpose, you could say. Uh, they all have a different function. The bass is often used to deliver power and, you know, a more solid feel. The um, middle regions here are often warmth. And then here at the mid-high, sort of, you're talking about clarity, and this is treble, which is just a final little very sharp touch that makes everything crystal clear. The reason I'm saying this is because it's very important for the following topic, which is the spectral composition. There is a reason why my voice sounds different from yours. 
and why a piano and a violin sound different even when they're playing the exact same note the exact same way. Once the, again, as set before, you can have a bunch of different sound waves at different frequencies, and the thing that determines what something sounds like is actually a combination of a bunch of different frequencies stacked on top of each other at the same time. So my voice sounds different from yours because I have a different spectral composition than you do in your voice. So here we can see these two instruments recorded on the same note. I don't know what note it is, but it doesn't really matter. Um, you can see that they have the same bass frequency, roughly, and this one has a lot less information than this one. And if you pay close attention to the sound of a piano and the sound of a violin, you'll notice that this one is a lot cleaner. And there's reasons for that, but it's mainly because it's actually a very clear and open spectrum. So the reason this sounds different is because it has a lot of extra additional smaller waves at different frequencies and different volumes as well, which make it sound different from this. And these waves above this first frequency are called overtones, and every single sound has a different composition of these overtones. Again, there's, there's 20,000 frequencies you can hear on average, so you have a lot of options in combining these. Um, so you could put any instrument here, any different type of instrument, they'll have a different composition. And this is actually how speech synthesis and TTS actually works. Um, you can just analyze someone's vocal spectral um, composition, I guess, or their, their components and replicate that with software. Just, you know, mimicking the combination of different frequencies and different sound waves on top of each other at, th at the same time. You can mimic anything. So, in theory, the very words I say right now could be recreated identically if you were to stack all those waves on top of each other, but you'd probably have to stack several billions of waves. <laughs> so, it's not a good idea. But in theory, that kind of stuff is possible. Which brings us to the next thing, which is equalization. This uses the spectrum, as you can see here. This is once again the 0 to 20,000 range. You can't really see it here, but... Um, essentially, this was me talking uh, at that time. You can see the little lines back here. Uh, I can drag certain frequencies down and remove them a little bit or weaken them. And I can push other ones up to boost them. So if I wanted to have a bit more bass in my voice, have it be a little bit more present, I can just dial this up. I'll demonstrate this in a bit, because you really need to hear it to fully hear the effect, I suppose. Um, but the concept of EQ is just getting frequencies and boosting and, and changing them a little bit to balance things out. You've probably seen this before. This is um, the, the standard fixed band EQ, as it's called. Uh, this appears in music apps pretty much everywhere. This is taken from macOS, I believe, so you've probably seen this. Um, and the difference between this and this is that this has fixed bands. You can see this one's on 32 hertz, 64, 125, it just goes up. And this one I can actually change which frequency I want to change, how much I want to affect the region next to it, and then I can change it myself. Very powerful tools, and we'll get into this in a practical session in a second. Lastly, one more thing, the coolest part of it all, <laughs> synthesis. Very simple, synthesis is creating sound from scratch and twisting it to your will to create anything you physically want. It's incredible. You can make anything you want with this, and I can guarantee you that pretty much all the music you listen to these days has a shitload of synthesis involved. Um, because in the end, when you think about it, an instrument needs to be perfected over hundreds of years. That's why violins and orchestras in general sound so beautiful, because these instruments have been in development for literal centuries. Um, but to get that perfect sound, you need to tweak the instrument physically over and over. Um, and with a synthesizer, you can tweak it all you want. There are massive downsides as well, but in terms of the spectral composition, you can make anything you want. And that is indeed why it's called a synthesizer. Yeah, it just synthesizes. <laughs> it does this through something called waveforms. Now we get back to the very start where I show you this type of wave. This is called the sine wave. And this is actually the core foundation of everything you have ever heard in your life. Sound is built out of these waves. They all look like this, every single sound wave and all the individual frequencies in any sound have this shape. As I said earlier, you can create different sounds by stacking these on top of each other with different frequencies, and you could create sounds that on a spectrograph look like this, or this, or this. And these all sound and look different because of a different combination of these waves stacked on top of each other. Um, so just by shifting that around and the combination of your layering, you can make any waveform and wave sound you want. I'll demonstrate these in a minute because they're quite severe differences. It's pretty cool to hear. Lastly, 
envelopes. This looks really complicated, but it's very simple. Let's say we have an envelope that is called on our volume. I'm going to press down the key on my on my keyboard or whatever. My volume is going to go up in my attack down time. It's going to go down in the decay phase. It's going to go here and hold in the sustain phase. And when I let go of my key, it's going to release and the volume will slowly decay over time. That's all this is. ADSR, attack, decay, sustain, release is a general phenomenon used everywhere in audio to control anything. I could map this line, this envelope to anything, to my volume, to my pitch, to anything. And we'll demonstrate that in a second. I was going to go into psychoacoustics, but honestly, fuck this. Let's get practical. <laughs> I'm getting a bit tired of talking nonstop. So I will quickly head out of here if my thing lets me. Yes. And I should be able to switch this up to my FL. Let me quickly switch this over. Now you should be able to hear this. Let me know if you can. Yep, with the same emote. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, it's useful, but so much. That, that's why I've stopped the theory now. <laughs> I'm getting sick of it myself, too. Um, now we're actually going to do some fun stuff. Um, although I find the theory very fun, too, but I'm a fucking nerd, so that's why. Um, actually, it's probably better to use a different one for this. I will use you. So, here we have this. This is a very basic synthesizer. Uh, and essentially, you can see the stream as well. Let me check that. Did I not show my desktop? Yeah, you can. Cool. Um, once again, here you can see the same shapes that you saw in the presentation. Uh, here's the mo most basic one. And now you can actually hear what it sounds like. Very pretty clean wave. Uh, is this audible, by the way? Is this too quiet, the stuff? Or is it too loud? Or Let me know. No, it sounds pretty good. Right, cool. Um, so once again, this is just the, the sine wave, the, 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 the core foundation of sound. And as I said, you can stack these on top of each other to get a different sound. So now we can actually see this in effect. I think you're now seeing that whole thing, aren't you? Oh no, you're actually seeing the full scene. Nice. I need to pop them out the stream because I can't actually see what's going on. There we go. So, um, oh, there you can see it active. A little quiet. A little quiet, then I will boost this up a little bit. I have had to turn this down because this thing is loud by default. There we are. Um, I just closed the equalizer. Come on. So, um, here you can actually see it. You know, with that one frequency, there's a couple of leftover things here, but that's artifacts. That's not actually in the sound itself. And I can switch this up by adding different special components. You can see a lot more, you can hear a lot more. And you can see the individual waves taking place. And I can do it with different ones too. You can see I have a different composition. And I can keep switching this up. Much more quiet, very similar to the sine wave, but a bit more aggressive. And then there's the full-on saw wave. And what you can actually notice if you follow this yellow line, that that one is aligned perfectly. That one is aligned but only has half of the actual waves. And that one is sort of a mix of the two, and this one actually goes down over time. So, just by changing the volume of those waves, and adding a few more, you get a very, very different sound. And these are some of the core waveforms you can use, and... A lot of sound synthesis is done through this. So we can turn this one off. Grab something far more advanced. Uh, don't worry about all the buttons and the knobs and all the weird shit. Oh god, that was very loud. So <laughs> It'll all make sense in a bit. So, once again, you can see that we have the same saw wave here as we had before in this one. Uh, you can see the same kind of structure. Gonna play the same note. Yeah, exact same thing. It sounds a bit different because actually no, it sounds the same because it's a good saw wave. There we are. Um, what I can do with this one again, ignore all the weird shit, is change this 
however I want. So, we're starting with the sine wave again. And then I can add harmonics wherever the fuck I want, which is really, really cool. Let's say we add one here. It's a bit high, so I'm just going to move these down a little bit. That was not the right button. And that way I can kind of shape a sound however I want. And I can keep on adding these to add more details and add more flavor to my sound. So essentially these these waves, these individual waves are just your ingredients and you're essentially cooking. And there's not really a recipe, you're just kind of going off creativity, creativity, which is the most fun. So you can shift these around and move them and tweak them and I can even extend them if I want. Let's get a lot more. Include more waves. So now I've made this kind of pretty sounding thing. So that's our spectrum. That's our harmonics. Now we're going to move to our envelopes. So here's the same thing. Once again, we have our attack. Uh, my screen is going black, hasn't it? Uh, yeah. Is Has it? Then I will quickly reset the stream. Oh. Has it still gone black? Uh, oh, that's curious. It doesn't seem to be able to load that one thing in. Oh, now it's doing it now. Weird. Okay. Um, either way, this is the same thing I showed before the envelopes. You have the attack, decay. The sustain is actually only a dot here instead of a line, and then the release. So you can see it happening. I'm going to hold down a key. And the second I let go, it fades out. And I can tweak this however I want. So let's say I want a direct attack. So it, so it doesn't rise. But instead it just does this. I want it to decay a little bit, for example. A bit too much, we'll tweak that. I want it to start a bit earlier so I can add another point in that decay phase. Tweak it however I want. And then the release. And now... What I've just done is essentially created a kind of keyboard sound that I can now play. But as you heard there, it sounds quite ugly when I switch chords like that. Because I have a very long decay, so my sounds are interfering with one another. So I can shorten that a little bit. And the pitch now goes crazy. <laughs> because my MIDI keyboard is malfunctioning. You gotta love it. So now, I've just made a playable sound. So, oh. now, we can shift it around further. So let's say, well, what we've done now is a very basic thing. I've linked an envelope to my volume. What I've done is I've linked a modulator to my volume parameter. Cool thing is, I can take anything I want. I can take my pitch and I can route an envelope to it and I can it's whenever I whenever I open a new thing it just crashes the stream. I'm not sure why it's doing that. So it's going to be a lot of resetting today. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> and it's still crashed. No, it hasn't. Okay, I'm not sure what this is. I've never had it before. And now I can change my pitch if I wanted to. I can go fucking crazy with this. <laughs> um, and we can reset it. Well, I fucking hope I can reset it. Ha! I can't, and my stream has crashed again. Give me just a second while I fix this up. I'm not sure why it keeps crashing it. That's really unusual. Doesn't do that normally. Using it when some app is on the other screen. I see. In that case, if I reset it, and I do this. Uh, is it doing it now? Is it fine? Is uh, it loading in for me right now? Then it's not fine. Let me see. Yeah, I'm not sure what this is. It's very strange. Good I can now. see it now. Weird. Okay. Well, at least it works. Also, this is uh, FL, by the way. So but you, you, you could do this shit in Reaper as well if you wanted to. Oh, cool thing is, is it not? Is it now broken again? Now it's black again, yeah. Fucking 
this is really annoying. Um, do I have another way of sharing audio if it goes for my full screen? I don't think I do. Okay, I'm going to stop doing the um, parameters then after this one, because I just want to demonstrate that there's different types of things. Uh, I will pop out the stream again, because it doesn't seem to make a difference. There we are. So, I've got the same parameters I had before, the pitch. Now I'm going to use this thing called an LFO. Which is a very strange thing. These are envelopes, sort of, that repeat themselves and that are fixed on a certain frequency. This is actually a sound wave played extremely low, but not used as sound, but as data. So I'm actually using the data from this wave, so the up and down data, to modulate something else. So my pitch in this case. Pretty cool stuff. And I can change the speed. I can change the heights or the intensity. So I can make a really light thing. Video gamey stuff. And I can change a bunch of other shit. But once again, that's the saw wave we saw before. Do all kinds of fun stuff. Really weird shapes. Like a very extreme version, for example. Can lower this. Really weird things. And I'm, I actually really want to use a drop down again, so. Oh, it survived. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> right, we go again. Oh. This is a really cool trick. Uh, the pitch stuff may seem useless, but a cool thing is, if I zoom in a little bit, you can actually use pitch envelopes to create something that's called a transient. That is a very strange behavior. What the fuck? I can drag this one up. It's gone black again, but just listen to the sound. You can hear it suddenly has like a little, 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 little punch to it. Just because I made a little clicky pitch envelope, and I can extend this if I want and make it really fucking weird. And that's automatically a laser sound. Everyone who does sound eventually makes a laser by accident. <laughs> it's one of the unwritten rules, it just happens. Not that it's a problem, because lasers are fucking cool, obviously, but yeah. So. And then I'm gonna hit the stream again. And then stop the drop down so it should now work. It doesn't. Fucking cool. I don't know what this is, man. This is not usual behavior. There we go. So we got a kind of kalimba like thing. Really cool stuff. And I can now change a bunch of, bunch of other stuff. So we take a look at this spectrum again. And I start tweaking other stuff. We can hear a lot of interesting things happening. What this does, it's a very unique feature, but it, it, essentially it shifts my overtones all over the place. And I can make very interesting percussive sounds with this. Like glass kind of sounds. I can play pretty things with this, I guess. Very nice stuff. So, just like that, you have a very pretty sound that you just synthesize from nothing. And yes, this synth is crazy. This is probably one of the most powerful ones out there. It's insane, and you can go completely crazy with the effects. Like, I think, I think the audio stream is in stereo. I'm not sure if it is actually. And you can add effects to it, so go with reverb. Even though the built in reverb is quite shit. Um the screen disabled. Oh my god. 
<laughs> yeah, it just uh, keeps doing it. I don't know why. Is it okay to ask questions and stuff? Or is like everyone so silent? Yeah, it is. Totally. Yeah. Well, I I'm new to this. So it's like, what software are you using for this? Um, this is. Ah, uh, it doesn't show that. That's annoying. This is FL Studio. The stream broke again. Um, this is FL Studio. Uh, there's a bunch of software like this out there. Just Google Digital Audio Workstation Comparison. You'll find a bunch of them. I see. Um, is there like a dedicated uh, pathway to learn audio as well in Arcane University? Uh, there's Sound Design, which is active, and I think it has a couple of pinned documents written by Nelder, uh, which explains some of the stuff. But generally, the best way is just figuring out yourself and just looking up information, looking up tutorials and stuff. But I believe the Sound Design channel has some information you could use and some claims as well you could try. Uh, uh, so there's, there's not really a dedicated way, but you, yeah, using all those different sources, you can definitely find your way around. I see. Um, that keyboard underneath, do you actually have a physical keyboard on your hand or is it just are you using a key? Like, uh, you can like do both. Um, there's a little button here that lets you... Uh, Use your PC keyboard, but I'm also using a, a MIDI keyboard on the side, ah. which you can use to play more precise things. So yeah, um, you, you don't need so that to do this stuff. So I'm assuming you have to learn music theory as well, like to understand yeah. like how to. If you want to do music, yeah, uh, I, I can explain that in a bit as well if that's uh, a desired thing by people. Yeah, I'd be interested in hearing that. Yeah, so I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, before right, I get to, you. Uh, yeah, no worries, man. Before I get to that, uh, there's one more thing I should probably touch on, and that is filters. Filters are essentially, once again, with the spectrum, it's got something to do with that. Uh, this probably isn't a great sound for it. So instead, I'm going to grab something else. Let's say we'll take... Um, well, I probably want to grab the same one. I'm hoping it doesn't fucking crash. We'll make something much more different. A very harsh thing. Let's go with like a really harsh... Dubstep bassy sound. My fucking stream broke again. This is the single most annoying thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe instead of like doing sh sh screen share, you could do application sharing. So you know. It is application sharing because you have to do that for the audio to work. Uh, yeah, I don't know what this is. Uh, rather unfortunate. I'm sorry about this. But maybe with one plug and open, it does work. So quickly, we'll just make a little aggressive thing wow that sounds so cool there's a little thing and then what i can do is use filters so um i need to do one thing for this to work actually uh i need to remove some of this filters What's are it? essentially what they let you do is they let you uh the whole spectrum it takes that and then you can remove frequencies just like equalization but instead of picking one frequency it went black again yeah. <laughs> There's not much I can do about this, I'm sorry. Um, it's okay. It's you can keep hell, explaining. I, I can keep explaining. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so instead of taking one frequency out, what you can do is... Um, it fixed itself, okay. You can remove an entire range of them. So... Like that. Very, very, very common uh, effect used in... A bunch of different music types like EDM and everything else. You can get a little that's disgusting. Jesus. You can get chords, uh, some beautiful chords in unison. It broke again, but it's about the sound. Yeah. And you can use the filters to control a bunch of stuff. A very common uh, occurrence in audio, and there's different types, which will have different sounds. So you have the low pass filter. Which removes uh, the higher frequencies. Yeah. Can you, pl can you please, that. can you please mute, uh, except for asking questions? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh, then there is a high pass as well, which actually removes the lower frequencies when turned open. I guess. There is a bunch of other ones. Uh, there's band passes, which only let a certain amount through. You can change which frequencies it lets through. And like that, you can do a bunch of cool stuff. I'm going to try and get it working again, because there's one thing I do want to show visually. I'm sharing the app because I have to, because otherwise the sound doesn't work, because Windows, I guess. 
I just disconnected. Whoops. Let's get back in. <laughs> oh, maybe that fixes it, though. No. Well, this is fucking great. Um, any questions, go ahead, because I have plenty of time to answer them, that's for sure. Uh, could you briefly explain compression? The concepts of it? Um, compression is a very simple concept and has infinite ways of usage. Uh, I could showcase a little bit. Uh, if we take our previous sound, I will drop it through a compressor, which hopefully it should show up. Uh, nope, it does not. It does, hey. Um, com this looks really complicated. Uh, it isn't, essentially, here's our sound. And what you can do with a compressor is set a threshold for your volume. Compression is all about volume. And at that threshold, when it, the sound crosses it, so like definitely it's crossing the threshold now by about <laughs> 15 decibels or something, uh, it's going to start removing volume out of your sound, depending on how you change it. So if I set it really extreme, it makes it quieter. And you can see the amount of reduction here. 30 de decibels is quite extreme. And you can tweak this to have it remove stuff. And you could use this if you have a very dynamic sound, like if I'm talking like this, and then like this. It's quite soft compared to close to the mic and far away from the mic. What I could do is put my own voice in this, and then compress it in such a way, it's now switching windows, this is great. <laughs> you can compress it in such a way where um, the louder parts would get pushed down, and then afterwards, I could push everything up, and then the loud parts pushed down, and the quiet parts unaffected sound sort of equal. And that way you can create a balance in your your volume, which is extremely useful for things like, well, pretty much everything. Drums, especially. Uh, the reason why the drums in rock music, for example, sound so fat is because they've just been compressed to hell, basically. Um, because drums have a very interesting behavior. Um, they're short and snappy, so like that, which means they have an extremely loud peak, but that peak is reached and left behind in a few milliseconds. And if you have a fast compressor pushing that peak down, what you actually get is you get the peak pushed down to the body of the sound, the rest of the sound, basically. And that integration of volume somehow makes it really punchy and powerful. So compression is used to reduce volume. You can tweak the amount, you can tweak the release as well. So I can do really extreme compression. You can hear it come back in there. And I can change how quickly it does that. So distorting makes sense and I can actually make it really long to the point where it doesn't actually come up in time before the release is finished so this line is just the reduction of the volume as you can see it going back up there I can change the value of that and this tool is used for a bunch of different, different things as I said actually a cool knob as well as the attack see it responds slower so this is a technique I use for my drums you let the initial punch through, but the rest of the sound gets compressed and affected. And that way you have a very punchy drum with a very powerful body. So that's essentially a uh, compression crash, crash course, and really there's, there's tons of techniques. Uh, you can actually use these with parallel stuff, where you have the same sound twice, one of them is compressed, the other is not, and that is a very cool layering technique to get a thicker sound. Tons of ways to use this both in a controlling manner to control your dynamics, as I explained, or in a stylistic manner to actually create distortion. For example, if we close our compressor, we open up this incredible tool. Uh, what you may have noticed is that this has that same diagonal line on it, uh, in that same square. This has two. This is essentially a compressor, but a really aggressive one, which you'll, you'll notice. This is what you call bass boosting, and what I call distortion. <laughs> uh, it's just a really aggressive form of compression where instead of lowering the sound at the end, like compression does, it actually, you can boost it at a certain threshold. And you can take that to the extreme and make things ridiculous. Pretty cool effect. So compression is actually used for boosting as well, for, I guess, like artistic choices and stylistic preferences. 
this is a very basic thing. Uh, I can shape this into different sounds at will, so I can make really complex patterns and change how it behaves. To get a sort of rippling distortion effect. And there are plugins specialized in this exact thing with a different model for each one. It seems that it's crashed, but it's about the sound in this case. It hasn't crashed. Yay. And you can choose different presets, different algorithms, I suppose. It's all the same principle, but in this case, it's combining the compression with different EQs. And this one's really cool because what you can actually do if I take um, that one, I can actually split this in the frequency spectrum. So once again, back to the frequencies, you can see that here, my first band ends at 190 in this case, second at, let's say about 2000, and I can control the amount of compression and distortion per frequency band. Really interesting concept. So if I want my, my sharp high end to be very bright and, and, and heavy, I can turn it up a little bit and shift the, the, the range. Get just that initial transient. And I can change a lot of stuff about the sound and I can remove the drive a bit on this, get it a bit cleaner. But then boost the low end a little bit and shift the dynamics a little bit and do whatever I want. So compression is used as a normal compressor. It's used in other effects. It's used all over the place to control and stylize pretty much everything. So compression is probably, besides EQ, the most used thing. So you'll find it everywhere. Um, aside from that, I was doing something else before I got into compression. Filters, that was it. I wanted to show you something because the low pass filter we talked about removes frequencies up there. Really cool little effect you can use. It's gray again. I'm going to stop after this because this is pointless without being able to see. I will get this fixed for the next one because there has to be a source for the problem. Quickly, quickly, what I can do is I can actually make custom filter shapes. So I can do all kinds of weird shapes and things. As you can see, I'm very professional. <laughs> and I can choose that filter shape one. You've seen the effect now, so the, you don't need to see it anymore. Very weird sci-fi sound, I guess. There's a free demo of this software called Evil Studio, and I just recommend you just dive in and just play around with sound and just with these knobs and with these things. Because you can do some really cool stuff with this. And that's a really fun thing to uh, to do. Music theory. Is that something we want to talk about? Because I have 10 minutes. Do we want a 10 minute music theory crash course? Is that adored? Or is that too complicated? I, I mean, sure. Go for it. All right. Music theory in 10 minutes. I've never done this before. I'm going to try and get it to work for once, uh, because I do need to be able to see... Alright, it's working for now, at least. Um, I was going to use the same plugin, but that doesn't seem to work well, so instead... We're grabbing a piano. Um, or actually, maybe the best option is this one. Because I think it has a better visual keyboard. Nope, it's even worse. Okay, we'll use this. So, here we have a little piano. I'm going to talk about probably about scales and about tension. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll cover everything. I'll cover jazz harmony. <laughs> if it goes black, let me know because i got to look away from my screen. But um, essentially, music theory, or I guess I'm going to talk about tonality, so actual notes. It's all about tension and the contrast between this tension. Um, so, for example, if I play this, I'll turn it up a little bit so you guys can hear a little better. Sounds quite pretty. Sounds quite nice. This does not. The reason for this is because I'm using a lot of notes at once, right? This is probably about 10 notes, I reckon. And that's actually 12 of them. Uh, and the cool thing is I can use a very similar amount of notes, but disperse them differently. 
get a very pretty sound. This is eight of them at once, and still sounds really nice. So, the reason for this is because there are certain, I guess, relationships between notes that sound good and others that don't. For example, this sounds terrible, but this sounds really nice. And there's a couple of those nice ones. There's a couple of ones that are in between. Still sound nice, but they're not as clean as these. And then there's the ones that are a bit harsh. Those two aren't that great. And then there's the one that called the octave, which is the same note, but an octave higher. These are intervals, so you have a bunch of them, eight of them usually in Western music. Uh, it's now focused on minus 2.54 dB. Enjoy that. Yeah, but uh, it, it, already, yeah. it always switches back when you start playing something else, so. Really? Yeah, that is you can really see the cool. piano now. That is intentional, absolutely. Um, <laughs> either way, uh, this <laughs> is about tangents, so. as I uh, said. And this goes back to what we talked about earlier with the frequencies. The reason this sounds a lot nicer than this is because these two bass frequencies fit into their own waves. So this is, let's say it has a, it's not correct, but let's say it has a wave or a frequency of, let's say, 500 hertz, so 500 um, cycles per second, 500 waves per second. This one is double that amount. It's a thousand, which means that those waves fit perfectly into the other one's range and their length. That's why it sounds perfect. The fifth, as it's called, has a very similar thing. It's not quite doubled, but it's a different ratio between the frequencies. That sounds great. Same with the fourth. Third is alright. Two is eh. And uh, reduced two is fucking hideous. And this way, you have different relations and different ratios between these frequencies that sound better or worse, depending on what you're doing. For example, what I can do is this doesn't sound great. But I can actually put it into context with a fifth to get this. Very beautiful chord. This sounds quite bad, but combine it with the bass note, we get a very beautiful, open, lush chord. And we can enhance this with higher octaves and all kinds of other crazy stuff. So let's say we'll do this. Sounds a very nice chord. Another one of those is, for example, 1 and 7. Sounds pretty shit, but combine it with two more notes. Get a sort of jazzy vibe out of this. I missed a few there, but ignore that. <laughs> Either way, um, by combining different notes and different ratios of frequencies, essentially, you get different emotions. For example, one of the scales uses a certain ratio of frequencies that sounds really beautiful and happy. There's other ones that use a different ratio, right? A different set of ratios that sounds a bit more dramatic. There's ones that sound a bit more Middle Eastern, I guess? For example, uh... And there's tons of these, right? And you can tweak them as you see fit. But essentially, by having a different set of ratios of frequencies, you can get different emotions. So if I play a piece, let's take a very basic chord scheme setup. We we'll go one. Let's, let's start a major first. We'll go one, then four. Then, uh, I don't know, two. Up to five. I just played the wrong thing. Hold on, one. Four, we'll go two, five. There we are. Let's do the same thing in a different scale. Very different vibe all of a sudden. Just by changing a couple of notes in my scale, a couple of those ratios, I've got a very different vibe to my music, essentially. Um, I'm not going to teach you all the scales, because you can look it up. There's, these are factual, these don't change. And I uh, see so you're making fun of the 2.54 dB. <laughs> um, um, and essentially, 
you can the cool thing about these scales is as I said it's a set of ratios between notes in between frequencies I can use them on any height so I can play a certain melody let's say uh, I can play it on a different set of notes for example and I can do it wherever the fuck I please um, a cool thing to note as well is that with that information in your head you can play a piece anywhere you want on any height um, Another cool factor is, for example, you can go out of this ratio, right? We call it a scale or a key. You can go out of key on purpose. For example, if I play something in minor here, I kind of want to go down a little bit. A little minor piece. I can do this. I actually used an incorrect note there, because in that scale, what you'd have is this. But I did this. You can use a note like that to lead your voicing into a different note. So instead of just going with the normal... Uh, I can go like this. So you can actually go out of key on purpose to create a different effect. There's a lot more to music theory, but I had fucking seven minutes for this. <laughs> so I can't cover it all. But what you need to know foundationally, essentially, about this is that music theory, at least the tonality, the harmony, is all about ratios and about the spreading and controlling of the tension between notes. Once again, a very clean tension or very harsh. And essentially, this spreads all across the piece. If you have a full orchestra, the composer and the orchestrator are actually taking this into account to make sure that overall things don't really conflict and they've balanced all these different energies and all this different tension to control their music. And you can use this tension to lead your piece into a different direction. When I play a jazz piece, for example, or an attempt at a jazz piece, some nice smooth chords, I can suddenly do this. That doesn't belong in key, but suddenly it shifts the vibe. It's a different tension between the notes. And then I can change it up to, uh, let's say this. And I'm back at the same chord where I started. But just by introducing that C minor seven, as it's called, instead of a C major 7, I'm shifting the vibe. Two notes change and the entire thing changes. Um, one minute warning, yes, I'm aware. Uh, I could do a full music theory lecture later on if that's desired, but uh, this is all I can do in 10 minutes. <laughs> um, but that was it for me. Uh, thanks for listening and thanks for suffering along with me through the, the technical difficulties. Uh, I wish I could have fixed it, but unfortunately... Uh, Software tends to be beyond your control sometimes. <laughs> Either way, um, yeah, I hope it was enjoyable to watch, and I hope it was understandable, because audio is fucking complicated. <laughs> so, on that note, mm -hmm. I am stopping my stream, and I believe I'm handing it over to Isaac with an interior lighting guide. Is that correct, I believe? I haven't got the thing with me right now. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Cool, well then, off to you.